moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching it. stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working See you.
that is who you are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are Well, good day, and welcome to Hearts Connection, worship from Bridge Street United Church, Belleville, Ontario, Canada, this time for the week beginning Sunday, August the 15th, 2021. It's good to have you here. Thanks for helping us build and maintain community during this pandemic time. We begin our worship as we light the Christ candle, and to do that, I call on the Fielding family. Folks? Good morning. We light this candle today to remind us that Christ is the light of the world, a light no darkness can extinguish. Won't you join me now, as with alternating voice? we offer the call to worship, as based on Psalm 110. The bold print invites your reply. Praise God. In this congregation, we will seek wisdom, studied by all who delight in them. God is gracious and merciful. For all those who practice it have a good understanding. Then, as now, here as there.
I invite you now to join with me as together with folk from across the United Church of Canada, coast to coast to coast, we join our voices to say aloud a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God. Who has created and is creating. Who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh. To reconcile and make new. Who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church. To celebrate. God's presence. To live with respect in creation. To love and serve others. To seek justice and resist evil. To proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Listen now, if you will, to this, our reading from Sacred Scripture. First Kings, verses 2 and 3, selected verses therein. May the words you hear speak to both your heart and your mind. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes of his father David only, he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon and to sacrifice there for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I will also give what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my commandments and statutes as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. May God bless to our understanding this, our reading, from a story of our faith.
Thanks be to God. I've entitled our message for today, A Wise Electoral Decision. A Wise Electoral Decision. Up until about five years ago, I followed with much more than a passing interest the ever-fascinating shenanigans that were, and surely still do, get played out in both provincial and federal politics. Indeed, at one time or another in the past, I've served as a campaign strategist during an election in Saskatchewan, a speechwriter to a provincial political party's leader, and a confidant to a past cabinet minister in the Ontario government. I've been reminded of that history as, over the last couple of weeks, I've read an increasing number of news reports coming out of Ottawa, suggesting that a federal election is in the offing, and more recently, when studying our lectionary assigned Old Testament lesson from 1 Kings, chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, and chapter 3, verses 3 to 14. That lection is a much-loved, much-cited chestnut, from which a thousand moralistic sermons have surely been birthed by preachers willing to enter the murky waters of judgmentalism. Mind you, I do understand why they would be inclined to preach that. For you see, as Solomon becomes king, and when given the chance to have any wish fulfilled by God, he chooses wisdom over the perennial favorites. Things like long life, good looks, inordinate wealth, absolute power. That identified as even a cursory glance at this lectionary reference reveals, there are a couple of noteworthy gaps in the presented narrative. I mean, there are some 25 verses between the selection in chapter 2 and those in 3, not to mention the ones preceding chapter 2, verse 10. The first open space is what happens just before Solomon dies as he gets last-minute instructions from David about scores that the family needs settling. The second is between the time that Solomon ascends to the throne and the occasion he and God, or Yahweh in the Hebrew, have their little heart-to-heart. -heart. Now, when one does read the parts that the lectionary omits, what you find is not Solomon sitting around having his daily quiet time in prayer and study of the scriptures. Rather, he's in the ruthless pursuit of control and the exercise of the royal prerogative of vengeance against enemies, real or imagined, of the crown. These include David's nephew Joab, whose men had killed David's other son Absalom as well as the murder of Shimei, a relative of the dead king, Saul, who had cursed David when he was down and seemingly out, but whom David had ostensibly pardoned. Thinking of conflicting characteristics within the same person, another part of 1 Kings, this time chapters 22-23, have always made me think of the baptismal scene in the movie The Godfather, Part 2. I say that because just before his death, Vito Corleone explains to Michael his heir apparent, whom no one thought would ever be in that position, the family plot to take out enemies, their enemies, who would be intent on killing the leader and taking over the associated criminal enterprise. After Vito collapses in his garden and dies, Michael attends his nephew's baptism as the child's spiritual guide, highlighting his dual role as both criminal and familial 
Godfather. During the baptism scene, at the most solemn moment, director Francis Ford Coppola interweaves the murders of all of the remaining enemies of Vito and Michael Corleone. Enemies which included, amongst others, Vito's son and Michael's brother, Frido, who, like David's son and Solomon's bro brother, Adoniah, is discovered to be a traitor to the family. Now, to be sure, it is a disturbing scene that mixes the sacred with the profane in a way that I believe captures the subtleties of what it means to wield the power of life and death, regardless of whether it's exercised literally or figuratively, whether it's exercised in an act of violence or words of degradation. With that in mind, there are a couple of central points that need to be remembered, it seems to me, especially when it comes the time for you and I, as citizens of this remarkable nation, to cast our vote in support of representatives to work on our behalf in the national capital. The first and most obvious, it seems to me, is the need for leaders to possess wisdom. Wisdom, that capacity to analyze, synthesize, strategize, all the while being sensitive and aware of the personal and societal consequences for actions taken or opinions held. For without wisdom, virtue, that which enhances the common good, is impossible. I hear that again. For without wisdom, virtue, that which enhances the common good, is quite impossible. Now, while my sense is that most sermons on today's electionary passage likely end on that very point, permit me to suggest that as those who have the right and, I must add, responsibility to be involved in Canada's democracy, not just with respect to our own needs, but also those of subsequent generations. You and I, it would seem to me, would do well to adopt a hermeneutic, in other words, an attitude or a lens of curiosity bordering on suspicion that invites us, encourages us, compels us to approach any candidate for public office with an intentionality and a inquisitive, inqu inquisitive, thank you, that's the word I'm looking for, inquisitive mentality that allows us to look beyond the public piety of the candidates presenting themselves for election, to look beyond that and to inquire as to their past, such that you can see, or at least understand, that there is congruity between the public face and the private person. For just as Michael Corleone looks so handsome and sober at the baptism of his nephew, all around that event are littered the remains of lives which he took, even as he made his vows and the seal of the Spirit was applied at the font. That same dynamic is alive in the scriptures. And that it is should not serve as, as a surprise. It rather ought to be a cautious reminder that what is presented in the Godfather franchise and movies of their ilk is not merely the product of some fantastic screenwriter's imagination. It is instead also something woven into the fabric of human nature. As such, our politics are no more immune from such tendencies than we are to any other shortcoming or foible. To my way of thinking, this matter is critically important in an election pending, election coming season. That said, I suspect we all have a well-developed hermeneutic of suspicion, albeit for the other and opposing candidate and not for the one of our 
preference. As one who has volunteered for a fair number of election hopefuls, let me suggest that being on the winning side of a vote-based contest is a real rush. The adrenaline flows rapidly. Conversely, there are few feelings related to public life worse than one feels when you find out the candidate from the other party is now going to be in charge. This election, not yet called, but in the making, will not be any different when it's decided. Because some portion of the Canadian populace is going to wake up feeling anxious and disappointed, if not angry and suppressed. Because this is likely to be the case, some of us will be prone to mm, give our scruples a sabbatical in the weeks leading up to the election's decision, telling ourselves that anything would be better than losing to them, whoever the them is. But, you know, that is not wisdom talking. For wisdom which grows virtue knows that good and bad often spring from the same source. Regardless of who wins our riding locally or forms the next government, be it your preferred candidate slash party or not, I invite you to see that all who throw their hat into the ring are not one-dimensional characters with either exaggerated qualities or over-magnified deficiencies. Rather, they are, and so I invite you to see all of them as complete persons, complete with a myriad of capabilities and quirks, each bravely offering themselves in service of their fellow citizen. That, I think, is a wise electoral decision. To see people on balance. To allow them to be fully themselves. And to admire the candidate who most represents your beliefs, your ideology, your hope for the future. I invite you to think on that very point and to vote. Thanks be to God. Amen.
our concluding hymn, Spirit, Open My Heart. hymns sung, prayers prayed, and the word considered. Our time in worship today draws to a close. Thank you so very much for being with us and for helping us continue to be a community of faith, strong and resilient and responsive. We are better for knowing and keeping company with you. Until next time, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May your home echo with the sound of laughter and love. And may you be held in the palm of God's hand, safe and secure, until we meet again, be it in this life or the next. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you again. Bye for now. Thank you.